Our gospel today gives us the account of our Lord's institution of the sacrament of confession or penance or reconciliation. All three terms are valid. Officially in the catechism, the sacrament is called the sacrament of penance. So the part of the sacrament is when the priest gives you a Hail Mary as a penance, you go outside and you do your Hail Mary. So that's the penance. The reconciliation part is when you express your sorrow in your act of contrition and the priest says, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then you are reconciled. The confession part is the hard part. That's the part that scares everyone off. That is, the, that is as it were, the crucifixion part of confession. First, you are crucified with humility by fessing up sins and giving accountability to another person on earth who represents both God and man, because when we sin, we sin against both God and man. And then we have the resurrection. When we come forth, from the confessional having been forgiven and beginning our new life of peace that comes through forgiveness. So as we look at the account between the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven, he emphasizes a couple of sacraments. So I call them the resurrection sacraments because that's when he's talking about them. Matthew 28, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And also the end of Mark. So the idea of Christ teaching everyone should be baptized in the whole world. And then we see uh, the road to Emmaus, which is a teaching on the Eucharist. Now, remember, the last thing Jesus does before he begins to redeem the world is gives himself to us in the Last Supper, the first Mass, the Eucharist. This is my body. This is my blood. And everyone's not there, only the apostles who are being ordained priests. And he empowers them and says, with a command, do this in memory of me. And they are ordained priests. Jesus isn't going to give them a command, do this in memory of me, without giving them the power to do that through the sacrament of ordination. We see later in Scripture that mentions the, the laying on of hands of deacons and presbyters, which is priests, depending on the translation, and even bishops. So, uh, we see the road to Emmaus, a wonderful passage in the Gospel of Luke. That's why I have quotes from it here. So Jesus is walking along the long road, which is about a seven-mile walk. You know, they used to get their uh, treadmill in back then without a treadmill. So they walked uh, to Emmaus, and Jesus is explaining the scriptures. It says he opened their minds. And they later on, after he disappears, said, were not our hearts burning within us? So, so their hearts recognizing that their source of life and love and truth was right there. God himself, the God-man, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is having a little fun with them, and he's teaching them something. So they come in, and he sits down, and he does a Mass. How do we know it's a Mass? Because of the phrases that are used and the sequence in which they unfold. I have it right here. Luke 24, 30 to 35. He took bread, number one, we see that in the institution narratives, takes bread. Number two, blessed it. Number three, broke it. Number four, gave it to them. And what happens at that moment? It says, their eyes were opened and they knew him. Aha! This guy we've been walking with, we didn't know who he was. It was Jesus, because he hid himself from them. He didn't let them recognize him until the moment that he gave them the Eucharist because he's teaching them and us to recognize that this is how he is going to be in the world until the second coming on the clouds of heaven with the angels of God. And so he gives them the Eucharist, they recognize him, and you think, wow, how about a nice hug? It's Jesus, we're so happy to see you. Nope, he disappears and leaves them with himself under the appearance of bread, the body, blood, soul, and the vein of the Eucharist, the living bread come down from heaven right there. And so what do we see in the last line? They knew him in the breaking of the bread. 
Let's hope we do as well, because it's important for us to recognize. I have a book I wrote on the sacraments called The Seven Fountains of Grace. What are these seven fountains of grace? The sacraments. How do we get them? He died on the cross to give them to us. Even after his death, the soldier pierces his side, and what comes out? The precious blood pointing to Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and the Mass, and the water pointing to the sacrament of baptism, which is the door to the sacraments, the first one that we receive. And so Jesus died on the cross to give us the seven sacraments. We need to appreciate them. We need to live with them. Now, the gospel today talks about one of the two forgotten sacraments. The other one is matrimony. <laughs> People forget to go to confession, or maybe they don't want to, and they forget to get married. They just start living together like they're married even though they're not. So. Those are the two forgotten or neglected sacraments, depending on how you want to look at it. But we're not going to mess with the marriage one today. We'll save that for another day. Today, we're going to look at confession, the fun one, because nobody likes to confess. So, let's take a look at what Jesus says here. Peace be with you. How does Jesus give us peace? By forgiving our sins and getting us into heaven. No greater peace than that. Peace be with you. He says it twice. First there, then it's when he said this, he showed them his hands in his side. That's how they got the peace. His hands in his side show the passion, his suffering on the cross. That's how we obtained the peace of Christ at a great price. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Then he says it again, peace be with you. And here's when it gets deep. As the Father sent me, I send you. What did Jesus do? Jesus forgave sins. And they would grumble against him. How is he who is only a man able to forgive sins? And just as they grumbled against Christ and said he can't forgive sins, only God can forgive sins because they didn't recognize the divinity in him, so too does the modern world grumble against the priest who gives the sacrament of reconciliation because they don't recognize the sacrament of holy orders and the sacrament of penance and that Jesus has chosen to work in this manner for our salvation. It is the choice of God, very clearly shown in the scripture. Now, there's a beautiful story of St. Catherine of Siena. She's one of those, you know, there's saints and then there's saints, the real advanced ones. Catherine of Siena, she's up there. She's even a little scared because uh, she told the Pope during the period of when they left Italy and went to Rome, you need to go back to Rome. That guy didn't listen. He died. Next guy, you need to go back to Rome. God tells you to through me. He figured, ah, crazy old lady. He died. The third guy, go back to Rome. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> he lived. So Catherine of Siena is in the church at a penance service and she can see in the confessional the priest is making the sign of the cross giving absolution to the penitent and she sees the blood of Christ flowing from his hands onto the face of his soul washing him clean because it is not me who forgives sins I can't do that I'm some guy from Jersey I can't do anything right However, Jesus, through the power of his sacrament of holy orders, which is independent of the holiness or intelligence of the particular priest, he gives the forgiveness. Same thing with life. Only God can create life. Scientists keep trying to do it, and all they're learning more and more is that only God can create life, and they're a bunch of buffoons trying to be more powerful than God. So how does life come? mommy and daddy and little baby. It doesn't matter how worthy or unworthy the parents are, the power of God the Creator is at work giving us a little baby through the parents and there is life. So did the parents create life? No, but God created new life through them. The power of God choosing to do amazing miracles and great things through his people. Life. The continuation of life. Little babies, so cute. 
long as I don't have to change the diapers. Now, what about confession or reconciliation? If God can create new life through a man and a woman, regardless of whether they're worthy or not, it's his power and he creates the life, is he powerful enough to restore spiritual life to a soul dead in mortal sin through his holy orders in the sacrament of priesthood? I think he can. So does the scripture. So we see here it says, he says to them, Peace be with you, as the Father sent me, I send you. So what does that mean? What are these 12 guys doing? They've been in the seminary with Jesus for three and a half years. He's been training them for a special mission, to continue his mission. He walked the earth forgiving sins. He walked the earth healing the sick. That's the sacrament anointing the sick. He walked the earth and gave the first mass, the Eucharist, the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. And now the apostles are going to do it. They are going to continue to be Jesus, walking the earth, continuing the ministry he began back in Jerusalem and Galilee until the end of time. The beauty of the priesthood is the continuation of the power and work of Christ. That's why we say the priest acts in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. You could say in a sense, I may get in trouble theologically, but who cares? It's always fun. You, uh, pa parents act in persona creator because it's through them that God creates new life and so too God does amazing things through his people. Look at Moses parting the Red Sea, Elijah calling fire down from heaven. Wish I could do that, that's pretty cool. But we'll have to settle for the forgiveness of sins and consecrating the Eucharist. So as we go on looking at this passage, he says to them, as the Father sent me, I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, sometimes called the little Pentecost. So here we have Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit on the apostles. When's the last time we saw that one? In creation, in Genesis, it says, he finished creating man from the clay of the earth, so you got this body there, and then it says, God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. That's where our soul comes from, folks. You may not realize it, but your soul is part of the Spirit of God. And so the people running around saying there is no God, it's a little silly, because their very soul is part of the Spirit of God. That's how they exist. So we exist with the Spirit of God within us. Now that's the Spirit of God giving life. Now, after sin, then we have to have reconciliation, and then we have things like baptism and, and things like that to restore us to grace that was lost through sin. So as we go on, receive the Holy Spirit. So this is a powerful moment. Jesus breathes on the apostles. What does he say after receive the Holy Spirit? Call fire down from heaven? Nope. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. And just in case there was any doubt that he was giving them power for forgiveness, he gives them the power to bind. Whose sins you retain are retained. Uh-oh. The power to bind and loose. What's an example of when a priest would bind someone in sin? As if we wanted to do that. We're in there to give you forgiveness. So there's a famous story in Ireland about a statue that was stolen from the center of town, apparently worth quite a bit of money. Disappeared for two weeks. All of a sudden it shows back up with a note on the bottom. Father wouldn't give me absolution until I put it back. Uh -huh. The power to bind. So when do I do that? Have I ever done it? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. And I have to do it because people need to recognize, you know, it's nice the idea I just go to God and I'm forgiven and, you know, oh, I'm going to confess my sins to God. As if he didn't know it before you told him. Really? Oh God, I did this. Oh, I didn't know how that happened. You know, no, God has set this sacrament up to give us some accountability. A little dose of humility. When we do something wrong, we got to fess up. At least the church is doing it privately. In the early church, you had public confession and public penance. And you had to stand in the back of the church and you couldn't come to communion until you completed it. Oh, those were the fun days. Now we've got, you know, the seal of the confessional and privacy and protection makes it a lot easier. So, 
Uh, sometimes if people are living together and they're not married, I have to say, hey, you need to get married. Whatever it takes to fix this, and if you can't get married, as in the case of when John the Baptist yelled at Herod, said it's not right for you to have your brother's wife, and then of course what happened? John got his head cut off. So John was beheaded for the truth of the Sixth Commandment and the teaching on the sacrament of matrimony. Imagine that. And this world does not like the teaching on the Sixth Commandment and chastity and matrimony. You find in the movies and the media constant ridicule of the virtue of chastity, the, warn the holiness of virginity, and that, you know, we call Mary the Virgin Mother. Virginity and chastity are good things. But the world, the world sees them as evil because the world wants to sin, it wants to go against God's will, it wants to reject the cross. So, we see here the sacrament of confession is given. Now, what do I find when I go to an anti-Catholic bookstore that claims to be Christian? I went and I opened up eight commentaries. They love to talk about the Bible. Okay, I can't wait to see what they say about this passage. Guess what they say? Nothing. Nothing. All blank underneath. Move on and talk about something else. And then there was one passage that I found. One book dared to say something. And it was quite amusing. And it went to explain this passage. And it said, well, Jesus was reminding the apostles they have the power to recognize that someone has, you know, uh, professed belief in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, been forgiven, and, and um, been restored. That's what that passage says. If you were in English class and you were to write that in a little essay explaining it, you would get an F. Because that has nothing to do with the meaning of the words in the sentence or the context or the way they're phrased grammatically. It's an absurdity. So there's certain passages that they don't know what to do with. Now, you might be sitting there in judgment. Father, I'm not convinced. I don't think I want to go to a man and confess my sins. Well, let's see if there's another passage that cross-confirms the power of the priesthood to forgive sins. Ooh, what's this? James 5. What do you know? Here we go. It says here, Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the priests of the church. Some translations have presbyters or elders. Same thing, the church leaders. And they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. What do you think I do when I go to the hospital? The anointing of the sick. Sometimes people recover completely, sometimes partially, and sometimes it's their time to go. But it's, you know, we don't like to have that sacrament associated with death. Because then people oh, Father just came and anointed him. It's over now. Here comes the undertaker. He's measuring him for the casket. No, no, you're supposed to understand a sacrament as giving forgiveness of sins and promoting physical healing according to God's will for the individual. So it's, it's a dual healing. It's a healing of body and soul. So as we go on further, it says here, the, the priest should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person. The Lord raise him up. That's a physical healing. And oh, what's this next line? Uh-huh. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Aha! Wait a minute now. I thought he accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. What's he got to be forgiven for? Uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. And you know what else it says in here that's interesting? Um, it talks about how my brothers, this is James, if anyone among you should stray from the truth and someone bring him back, he should know whoever brings back a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Wait a minute now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus covers all my sins. Well, how can, how can me bringing a person back to the faith cover a multitude of my sins? What's this nonsense? It's called penance for sins after the uh, baptism. When I go to baptism, I'm forgiven. What is God's providence for sins committed after baptism that might be mortal or serious? 
confession. That's with the providence that God has given us. Now sometimes they baptize you again. You can't be baptized again. You get the sacrament once. But there is the sacrament of reconciliation or forgiveness that comes. And there still remains, perhaps in some cases, some extra penance that needs to be done. Now, today is Divine Mercy Sunday. How did we get this title for the first Sunday after Easter? Well, let me tell you a little story. Back around the time of World War II, St. Faustina, a nun, was in a convent and Jesus appeared to her with some revelations. One of them was that image that's over there of divine mercy with the red for the blood and the white for the baptism of water. And Jesus says to her, I'm revealing to you the, the divine mercy because the Sunday after the resurrection, it's pretty significant, so we got resurrection. Oh boy, he's risen, hallelujah, we're saved. What happens the next Sunday? He gives us the sacrament of penance, sacrament of reconciliation or confession, the beauty of that mercy Sunday. So Jesus wants to emphasize it. So he tells Saint Faustina that anyone who goes to confession and communion on mercy Sunday or even 11 days before or after will receive complete remission of all eternal punishment and temporary punishment. Now that's the big one. When you go to confession normally, that wipes out eternal punishment, which is hell. But your purga charge, oh boy, I don't even want to look at mine. Your purga charge is there. So when you go to confession on Mercy Sunday, God willing, Father Jose is going to come today and I'll get my chance in. I lost my other two confessors, the Lord called them home. Um, but you have complete remission of all sin. Temporary and eternal. That frees you from hell and purgatory. So, what do we see as an interesting witness to the truth of this? The Archbishop of Krakow, later to be the Pope, sends the papers over to Paul VI for approval. They're not approved. He reworks them thinking, okay, I didn't do it as good as I should have. So he sends it over to Rome to be approved. What happens? Paul VI dies. Then what happens? Karawatiya is elected Pope. And there on his desk after he's made Pope is his little letter <laughs> asking the Pope's approval. What do you think he did? So as a final beautiful testimony to the truth of this wonderful gift of this sacrament and the desire of Jesus to make it more well known and received, on his death he dies on the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday after having been to confession. Let me tell you folks, that's the way I want to go out and I hope he's listening. I would love to go on the Feast of Divine Mercy after having been to confession and communion. Skip that purgatory charge all the way. That's my, let's just go. That's the way to go, man. Now, the thing is, is that there's a lot of attacks on this sacrament. And you need to remember, how does the serpent work? The serpent likes to cast doubt and confusion and put forth half-truths which can also be worse than whole truths. What's the first thing the serpent did? Eve had the word of God. You will not eat of the forbidden fruit or you will die. What does the serpent say? No, you will not die. Calls God a liar. There's Eve trying to make up her mind. Do I listen to God or the serpent? The serpent does the salesman pitch. Oh, God's keeping it down. If you eat this fruit, you'll know good and evil. You'll be like God's. you got to listen to me. I'm, I'm selling you the truth here. The father of lies, Jesus calls him in John 8, and a murderer from the beginning because the lie he gave Adam and Eve brought murder to their souls and their bodies. They later died. Very sad. Now, in our modern world, we are experiencing something that I... Bishop Sheen made a comment one time, the only thing worse than sin is the denial of sin. Now, as I mentioned, the serpent likes to quote scripture. What does Jesus do in the temptation in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke? Satan quotes scripture and misinterprets it, and Jesus quotes scripture and interprets it properly. Three times they go back and forth quoting scripture. Now, it's important to interpret scripture properly. 
It's one thing to know the scripture, it's another thing to understand the scripture. So we need to have both. So when I understand this passage of today properly, I know that Jesus gave me this beautiful sacrament of confession for sins committed after baptism. So what do we see in the modern world? Christian churches claiming to follow the Bible and the Word of God, denying huge portions of truth, huge portions of the commandments, and rejecting the cross of Christ. So what do we see? They quote the scriptures and they say we're a Christian church and they deny the life of the child in the womb. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb for joy in the presence of Christ, showing he had a soul and a relationship with God. They deny that. And so they're just like the world. They say, it's okay, you know, whatever you want to do with the baby in the womb. What else do they do? We are under serious propaganda attack in the media, attacking the natural order given by God for the family, a man and a woman and a baby. You would think it wouldn't be controversial. All they're doing is trying to shove these lies and propaganda from hell on us at every turn in the media. Now if what they're saying is true, and these Christian churches that say it's okay, then God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. You can go there. Sodom and Gomorrah, you can go there. There's pictures, YouTube. The rocks that are there have the highest amount of sulfur, like 90% of any rocks on the planet. It's amazing, the sulfur content. And you can see giant buildings covered with ashes and sulfur rocks. It says in the scripture that God rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurious fire from heaven. So what do we see here? St. Jude. Nobody reads St. Jude anymore. Who reads St. Jude? When's the last time you opened up the St. Jude, huh? St. Jude is tough. You read his letter here. Let's take a look at what St. Jude says about the modern lies where we have Sodom and Gomorrah rising in the media and trying to tell us that there was nothing going on there that was wrong or sinful and that it's okay these days and you can follow the scripture and, and live like Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's what he says. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns which in the same manner indulge in promiscuity and practice unnatural vice. You got that word? Unnatural vice. And that's what's being pushed on us in the attack on the family. Unnatural vice and they serve as an example of undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. The only thing worse than sin is the denial of sin. Thank you, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. So what we have is a world that attempts through its lying propaganda machine in the media and everywhere to deny sin. And that's the serpent at work, denying the word of God. Did God really say that? No, he didn't. Undermining the word of God in the scripture, denying the truths, giving us half-truths, trying to confuse us and put us on the path to hell. So let's remember, there's the scripture, the word of God, approved by the church when they decided what books would make up the Bible, and then there's the authority of the church to interpret it. And if we want to be saved, we need to stick with the proper interpretation of scripture given by the church and not what the serpent throws at us through the lying propaganda of the media.